So this is the parole board, the dark room that we have, one of the creepiest rooms that we have. Usually uh, we keep it open, so perhaps the customer must have closed it. Passing this cell actually it gives me the chills every day. Once like, when I was passing by, it was in a cold winter morning, I felt like someone jumped out of the room and like, I just stepped back, but there was no one. When, we, when it was a bit peckers, people would come here all excited, da da da. I would give them the room and in half an hour, they'd disappear. They wouldn't even ask for their money back, they're just gone, you know. So they must have experienced something, seen something, I don't know. Two days ago, I was just coming in the door and it opened and it actually opened, you know, and I was like, thank you. <laughs> Because what else are you going to do? <laughs> it wasn't windy, it, you know, like it was just bizarre. Well, we are ranked among the top six haunted places in New Zealand. I get a lot of people on a daily basis who can see, communicate, even uh, yesterday. There was a person who had bruise marks all over his body after doing the prison and he was horrified. So I've, I've experienced a lot of things as well. I live here in the night on the warden's house so with some other colleagues. Sometimes in the night you can hear footsteps outside, people walking around, knocks on the doors, people playing with your hair, blowing on your face, all kind of those things. And sometimes you even feel like someone is staring at you. but. You look around, you can't see anything. We had only been a few weeks into the process of setting up and one night we brought some of our crew in and several things happened on this night. It was really weird. So we'd gone and got a uniform off a mannequin in a guard cell but may also have been Kiriopataro cell and we left the mannequins lying sleepy on the bed and then went about our business. Uh, and I was painting one of the girls' faces and... I hear this noise at the door because some of the guys had come to the door and felt what I thought was someone pushed past me and one of the boys was um, well built like me and so I thought it was him and I went to say oh what are you and there's nobody there and I look and they're still at the door and the girl I'm painting looks at me and I'm like it's all good just don't bump me because I'm about to do her eye um, and it's about this yeah it was probably one of the first five or ten things that had ever happened to me up there but we get to the end of the photo shoot we take the uniform off the actor we go to open the cell door to the guards room and I find out later that it's quite common but it's always very hard to open so we call the manager at the time she comes and she just goes and pulls it and goes what's your problem and we're like oh obviously we're weak today and we walk into the room and the mannequin that we'd left lying on the bed was all like totally all screw with and we were like I don't know about this place guys. One of our lasses who was training to be a nurse she was um, she used to just come up and do some part-time cleaning her name was Tracy and she was listening to her music and mopping away and there was a guy behind her and she says me because she's from London she says me I've just done that floor you know and he just walked through the wall well Tracy just dropped everything. She was out of there and she's never been back. So, um, yeah, she, she'll come, she'll come as far as, as here. She's been twice, but she won't bring her kids in. And she, you know, like it's just a, a no man's land as far as she's concerned. So we had to pack up all her gear and, and deliver it off to, to her. It's a wooden place with a tin roof and when it's been cold winter, frosty morning and the sun hits it and you get that sound of the everything moving and yeah, you'd get that sound without it having to be a fresh morning. Like there were specific sounds between 8.30 and 10 in the morning as they woke up and they got ready for their day. Yeah, very uncomfortable going in there to open up by yourself or close late at night. So we are at the women's wing now. It's considered to be creepy for many people. People keep on seeing people in the cells. And on cell 24, a lot of people can see a woman sleeping on it. The head and the body and all. So 
most of the times we get customers who come running back with their devices they would return it and would not even ask for a refund just they'll keep it they'll be like this place is so creepy man we are leaving would be my first six months that I was there I heard it two different times during the day to the point that I asked Marion if they had neighbours with a young child is that I heard a baby crying and it will be in that front yard area where everyone comes in to get processed and Claire Isabel like a young year old child maybe a little bit older and crying I, yeah I heard it a couple of times and and I said oh Marion and she goes oh you've heard the baby and I was like I don't like this yeah, that was unnerving. Me and my wife, we experienced some stuff. I don't know, it's a paranormal things that normal life you can't explain. Um, one of the main thing I experienced, um, we call this infirmary, the room behind me. Um, I moved into that room by myself. It was been closed for years. One night, around midnight, I saw a person right next to my bed looking at me still remember face, bald head guy, uh, had a beard, not long, trimmed. Um, he had a green Maurice necklace, the stone. We had eye contact for like pff, more than five seconds. We were looking at each other. I wasn't scared because I'm used to this place. I thought, oh, there's someone. Um, so after five, ten seconds, there's an earthquake happened. I was at the edge of the bed, so I lost balance, fallen from the bed. He disappeared, I went to bed, back to sleep. Nothing happened after that. Next morning I mentioned our guys, staff. Yeah, I saw someone, I don't know who was that. Well, he was in my room last night. That's all, I didn't explain anything. Next day, I saw the same guy. I, oh, this is not normal. I remember this guy from somewhere. Yes, from last night. So we were looking at each other. Then that time I got freaked out because I remember seen the same guy last night. I tried to move, but I couldn't. I went to a mode like froze and I tried to scream. Then nothing came up from my throat. Then I like, no, this is not good. Still, he was looking at me. I was looking at him because I couldn't move. I didn't have any options. So then I thought, oh, I remember last time, last night there was an earthquake. Then I lost the balance. I was like, I moved my whole body like a robot. Remember, then I fell from the bed. So, <laughs> my bed used to be here up to like here. So, the guy I saw was here. Pretty sure this thing was there that time. He was sitting the back there. Next day I told our guys, one of staff members had contact to a person that communicated with spirit, of course. He came here, went to my room. I left him and all the staff there. I went for my lunch, came back. Then I saw he was sitting on my bed and drawing a picture, looking at the same place. But I was like, oh, okay. Then first thing I noticed then that necklace, then the beard, the bald hair. I had only one question. Is he happy that I'm in room or not? Because <laughs> otherwise I'm gone from this room. He said, he's been in this room before you. He wasn't a prisoner. He came before the prison started. But he died here. He's sort of stuck in the place. But he's not angry being stuck. Then I asked him, um, am I disturbing him anyway? Or do I have to change anything because it's not normal to live with a ghost or um, spirit that you can't see, you can't communicate, you can't ask a question from him. He said, no, nah, um, apparently you just don't disturb him, you're on the talking stick. I said, what? Oh, the phone. Oh, yeah, because he didn't know what to call for the cell phones because there was no cell phones 300 years. When after that, when I used to go to my room, I started knocking, letting me know that I was coming. But I never saw him again. I didn't experience anything out of normal in that room. My friend Michelle and I were sitting in the room over there, um, in the office there, and it was fairly dark, and it was on one of those scare tour nights when there was some backpackers doing bits and pieces. But everyone had gone through past the hanging yard, and of course we were sitting in the office looking at the computer and whispering away to each other, not wanting to put the lights on because we didn't want to spoil the ambience for everyone else. 
So it was just out of the blue that it was like 2,000 sparklers, you know, like real phosphorescent white light um, lit up. And we just looked at each other and like, what the? And um, Michelle dives up and she slammed the door. And, and I was looking up at the camera and I went, oh, look, there's somebody walking across the court, courtyard. It's this woman dressed and in sort of old fashioned gear. I said, it's one of them blooming actors. They're just having a laugh. So I went, you know, like out, <laughs> out to have, have them on. Nobody there. And, you know, like we searched from top to toe. They couldn't have gone that way. This was locked from this side, all behind us, totally locked up. Nowhere could that person have gone. And it's a lady, and Ali would tell you that as well, that there's a, a lady in that office area in old-fashioned clothing who just doesn't want to move on. My routine every day at the prison is announce myself in Māori and in English. Uh, Come on, it's time to get up, we've got to get going. You know, routine guys, let's have a good day. Or if it was really yucky weather because you had a lot more trouble, a lot more weird stuff happen on a cold, nasty day because it's horrible in there. So we're like, I'm really sorry guys, it's going to rain and then we'll stop the rain and you'll be fine, just a bit of huddle. For me it made sense to be, to try and be familiar, to try and have some empathy for whatever's there because I needed it or they to work with me, not against me and not on to the people I was bringing in as visitors. This last year winter I had a group from South Island uh, they were finishing the tour, it was around 4.45 in the afternoon, so they were at the hanging yard, so I started closing the prison. And after closing it up, like while I was at the women's wing, I was able to hear two women whispering to each other in a very loud way. So I thought, oh, it might be those two ladies who are at the hanging yard. But so I came from the women, women's wing to check on them, but they were silently just sitting and listening to the audio devices. So I shut down the entire prison and I, when I came back, those two ladies wanted to show me the rooms that they felt haunted. So we came back into the prison and after we came out from the main door, we locked the door, we stepped out, all of a sudden loud thuds and knocks started going inside from the prison. From both the ways of the corridors, you can hear footsteps and people banging on the walls very, very loud. They got really afraid, including me as well. And we also had another guy that we know personally um, from other work that he does called Darren Botica. But because I used to live in behind here, we actually went um, with Darren and my husband and I were not totally comfortable about hanging or washing out that side gate there. We asked Darren to, to go around and he actually said there's people buried there as well and that he, he said, OK, show me the, the bits that are concerning you. So we went out there and, you know, I had washing on the line and he said, you shouldn't have washing there. This is an old um, burial site. And with that, my string, it was just um, wire you know, tied up with string and all that. It went bing, and the, wa the washing hit the floor. And I was like, okay, right, thanks. I hear you, I hear what you're saying. Then we proceeded to go round to the hanging yard. We used to have a kit set gallows round the back and it had a rope, which was very, very heavy and not a correct rope, but it was something that would uh, not encourage people to muck around with it. And he said, this has got to go. And the rope fell. <laughs> the rope. <laughs> Honestly, you, would, you couldn't read about it. It just hit the deck. Staff room and the kitchen, we had to walk past the entry into the hanging yard. I seen a person. He was just walking past the doorway, taller like well built big guy walking past normal speed not like a flash normal person walking past right after him I've been I just checked the hanging yard nothing there and same place we used to have a washing machine I don't know now but we used to have a washing machine we come to there so I mean, one day I was taking the washing then I saw uh, oh, I saw him again then had a look nobody's there um, that same person multiple people have seen. 
in the um, hanging area, it's more I've had someone walking backwards and forwards behind me when I'm talking through each of the major stories of hangings or in like a just a little shove which is always like hey I'm telling a story the best I can or someone rushing up and then being right behind you and you're like okay this it's gonna be close that's cool I'm just gonna walk now yeah the feeling of being chased when I was leaving the dome area one night that was uncomfortable so yeah more a sense of people being there more than actually seeing them, which I'm really happy with. Don't really need to see too much. Also remember us having a lass in that detox room over there, and we had four sets of bunk beds, and you know how strong those steel bunk beds are. Well, the bottom bunk was, it was as if it was fluid, and it was banging against the wall and the person on the top bunk was not moving. And this was a lass called Lisa from Canada. And she had a face floating. She said it was like a round Maori face floating above her, sort of um, talking to her, not in a good place. And that's why we stopped using that detox as a dorm. The people that would have been in there when they were alive, a lot of them would have had developmental stages where they stopped mentally at maybe 8 to 12 years of age. That's when their influences went wrong. And so they can't, they were young men with a with a child's mind. So you've got to think, you're probably still like that on the other side. You may know the difference between what was right and wrong, but you're a bit confused. So I just tried to be empathetic because I thought if it was me in the same situation, I'd want that. I'd want someone to try and care. And it made life a lot easier when mum says, get in your cells, I've had enough today. You just get a bit of a change, a bit of a change. Like there was a weird, weird day. One of the other workers asked me to go tell off remand and it was really dark and shadowy. And I had had enough that day. I was very grumpy. There was stomping of mum afoot. This behaviour is not acceptable. You bugger off back. I've had enough. Get in your cell. And then... The light changed and the shadow disappeared. And I was like, okay, this, well that, that works for me. I'm going to have a cup of tea now and I'll just get out of there. Well, it took me some time to get used to it, but now I'm actually used to it. So I believe I respect them and they respect me back. They were real people as well at one point and we need to be respectful for them. So if they need to be here and if they enjoy their presence here, we would respect them and we would like to blend with them as well. So it's their home and we would like them to stay that way. Fifteen odd years, however, there's been nothing malicious that I have heard of or experienced. My wife and I were staying there and uh, sometimes the TV would go on. And then you go to the toilet and you come back and the, the channel will change. You know, and you think, oh, what the hell's going on here? You could be asleep in the bedroom and next minute the lights will go on. Maybe a reminder to let you know that, uh, yeah, they're around. And, uh, I look at it as a positive thing. There are people who, well, have passed on. Uh, maybe they don't actually realise they've passed on. Uh, it's, it's still something is still going on there. The residual energy is still in the place. I like it the way it is. I would not like it any other way. Um, I, I feel um, like there's a mutual respect, I would say, and that I'm totally comfortable. I can walk around here at, you know, two in the morning and, and don't feel um, threatened or anything. It's only when you actually go out the gates that I feel, I feel more um, in harm's way than I actually do in here. Plus we had Uncle Johnny Hohepa, who was a, a Māori kaumātua, who actually blessed it for my husband and I when we first came here. And he said that as long as we're here, everything will be fine. 